welcome. My name is Trevor, and I'm a math professor at the University of Victoria, uh, slash YouTuber or EdUtuber as they sometimes say. I, I make a lot of math videos and post them for my students and post them on YouTube. In this video, don't worry, we're not going to do any math, but I wanted to give a little behind the scenes. I wanted to explain how I make my videos, the technology behind the videos, the thinking behind the content of the videos, and the role that videos play in the larger learning process, at least in the courses that I teach. If that sounds good to you, well then, give the video a like for that YouTube algorithm, and let's see how I make my videos. Let's talk about the technology first. I actually think the content of the video is more important than the technology, but the technology looks pretty fancy, so how do I do that? Now, I'm a mathematician, so I like chalkboards, and I've created a fake one in my virtual classroom. I can bring up a graphic over here, I can bring up another graphic over there, I can have equations, I can have animations, I can put whatever I want on these screens, and I can, kind of like a weather person, gesture and talk about the different formulas and graphics that I'm using. The way I control this is with this little clicker that I have. I click the buttons on that and it just advances the presentation on my computer. More about that in a little bit. Now, I'm not actually in front of a chalkboard. This is just my office and I've got a green screen in it. It's just a piece of fabric that I have pinned to the wall. And then over there is the camera which is recording me. This is the Nikon Z50 which is a new mirrorless camera that I actually just got a few months ago and I really really love but is probably massively overkill for this kind of application. I also have a couple of LED light panels. These are really nice at improving the video quality and having a nice crisp clear image and it really helps with the green screen as well. I'd always recommend having just as much lighting as you possibly can get and you don't have to get anything particularly fancy. I'll link the specific lights that I use down in the description, but I think you can definitely get cheaper ones than those, and I'm not sponsored or anything like that. I also use the Blue Yeti microphone, just because a little bit better audio quality than the microphone that's in my camera. I'm also a big fan of using my tablet to actually just write with my pen, and I can draw some integral from A up to B of, say, f of x dx. And I particularly like my tablet when I'm trying to go at a pacing where writing it down, which is a little bit slower, is just easier for students to follow along than it is to quickly advance through my PowerPoint presentation. When I want to talk directly to the camera when I'm not showing any math, but I want to talk a little bit like this, then I set my camera up on a tripod and it looks a little bit like this. With a lot of these tech things, my general impression is that you can improve the quality by spending more on lights and cameras and microphones, but that you can really make a very viable product with pretty cheap technology these days. And so, I would only encourage you to spend a huge amount of money if you're really wanting to go far. Like, for myself, I'm both a professor and trying to be a YouTuber, and so having some of the sort of slightly fancier technology I think is helpful, but definitely not crucial. Okay, so let's move to the hardware side. What do I do on the software side? How do I actually make my videos? Now, all of the math and the animations, I actually just put into PowerPoint. PowerPoint is the place where it sort of holds the whole presentation. PowerPoint is just easy for adding a graphic that I can move around, for adding different types of equations, and I can just play with where I put them on the screen. The background of my PowerPoint slides are the fake chalkboard image that I was talking about before. So if I start my presentation here, there's a few things that I like about it. This clicker we were talking about before, when I press that button, it advances on my PowerPoint screen. And I often like to do this thing where my equations appear sort of symbol by symbol so I can sort of advance along and the students see exactly what they're supposed to focus on. I'm also a really huge fan of the morph transition that sort of allows me to move different portions of equations around the screen and again, make it easier for students to sort of track where they're supposed to be focusing on. So to actually record any given video, I go to slideshow, record slideshow from the beginning, and then when I finish doing that, I go file, export, create a video, and this is just going to create a really nice 1080p video of the background. I make the images that I include in my videos using a couple different pieces of software. One of the big ones I use is MATLAB. MATLAB is something where I can put in a bunch of different code, and MATLAB will let me export these nice images with transparent backgrounds that I can include in my different videos. I'm also a big fan of using some of the tools that students can interact with as well, like GeoGebra or Desmos. For example, in this Desmos that we have here, we're trying to figure out arc length, and so the idea of breaking up a curve into a different number of components, the students can play around with that. They can manipulate the endpoints and 
they can see really nicely. So for instance, I might include this animation within a video and then students could play with that animation through a link to Desmos after the video. The final tool, and this is one of the most important ones that I use, is my video editor. So I've got the green screen image from the camera of this recording. I have this screen recording from PowerPoint. How do I amalgamate the two into the same thing? Well, I have to use a video editor for that. I personally am using Premiere Pro. I really like Premiere Pro. It's a very advanced one, but it's probably overkill for most purposes. If you look on the timeline, there's two different video clips. If I hide the bottom one, the top one is the image of me. And it looks all black because what I've done here, if I take away, is I've had the green screen behind it, and then I've used something called keying to just remove out the green color. And so it just sort of appears transparent, which in Premiere Pro appears as black. And then if I come along and show underneath of it, showing underneath is the recording from the PowerPoint. I can turn myself off and see just the PowerPoint or include both of them, whichever I prefer. I can also look down at this waveform and make cuts whenever I make a mistake or a break and want to eliminate a little bit of space. It makes it very easy to eliminate any of that dead space or mistakes that I might have made. After I finish editing on Premiere Pro, I consider my video done. I export it, put it up on YouTube, and share it with my students. Okay, so that's how I make my videos, but what goes into the content of the videos? How do I think about those videos? Now, I teach math, which can be a little bit of a technical subject, but I really take the view that math is taught through stories. I try to make all of my videos have a little bit of a story in them where there's tension, where there's resolution. I don't mean tension between two characters who are fighting each other. I mean having genuine questions that lead to an exploration where we try to figure out how to resolve those particular questions. There's often a sort of climactic moment in a video where we really achieve something meaningful, a new shift in philosophy or a new tool that we finally managed to develop. One of the ways that I try to get this more story aspect is actually something that Trey Parker once said about storytelling, which is that instead of having a list of and statements, this thing happens and this thing happens and that thing happens, math can sometimes feel like that to students, you really try to use buts and therefores, like this thing happened, but then this unexpected fact came out, and so we had to do this other thing and therefore that led to something else. This is how I think good math stories can be told. I'm also a really big fan of what I call show don't tell. One of the advantages of recording videos is that we can use a lot of computer graphics to illustrate challenging concepts and build a lot of intuition within students' minds. This is often challenging to do in a normal sort of chalk talk on a chalkboard, but with a video you can spend the time to make really nice animations and if you can show students something so they have a nice visual intuition, I think that's really going to aid any computations that you might do. And so I try to add as much showing into my videos as possible. And then the final big thing I think a lot about is cognitive load. So the amount of cognitive effort that students are having to do to understand this video. And I really try to fine tune that cognitive load by the pacing of the video, how fast I'm going through different computations, how much information I put on the screen trying to highlight what it is that students are supposed to focus on so they're not having to think about that themselves as they watch this video, and generally trying to minimize the sort of extraneous cognitive load, the, the portion of learning that is from the way it is presented, to make that load as small as possible so that it's easier for students to come along. I try to keep my math videos relatively short, mainly focused around one or two core learning objectives. Students should be able to watch the video, know what it is that they're going to learn in this video, and accomplish that particular thing. If the videos are spread out to be longer, then it's a little bit more challenging to keep all of the new ideas in track. So you can just make multiple videos if you need to cover multiple learning objectives. Finally, maybe I'll note that the reason why I do all this tech to have my face present inside the videos is that I think that this can lead to increased engagement. You're talking to an actual person that presents and you follow along and I can gesture at a particular math formula. And I think this can also make a difference in creating engaging videos as well. Okay, so that's a little bit about some of my philosophy for making videos. But if you're a student in my class, what is the role of videos in the learning process? In an online and asynchronous course, which means you're watching sort of videos that you could do at any time, the videos sort of replace a lot of the traditional lecture that you might have in a normal face-to-face -face class. But the point is that videos are not the only thing that a student should be doing. 
A video may introduce a concept, but it's very important for students to take that concept, to wrestle with it, to ask questions, to collaborate, to practice, and ultimately to be assessed on their understanding of it. So some of the ways that I accomplished this is that videos live within a larger learning management system. It's not just a video by itself. I give a little bit of a text description of the video. I say the learning objectives that explain what is this video actually about. I sometimes have pre-video ponderings where students are asked to think about something prior to engaging with the video. I have post-video ponderings where students want to reflect after the video. And I usually incentivize watching a video with some sort of checkpoint quiz that provides some formative feedback to the students so that they can understand how they learnt the material and indeed can get a little bit of incentive to actually watch this video. I think the biggest takeaway if you're a student who's happened to watch this particular video is that the video is not enough by itself. You have to be reflecting, you have to be thinking, you have to be practicing the concept. And I know that some students go and see all these playlists that I put on YouTube and they just watch them start to finish very, very quickly without necessarily internalizing all the concepts. And if that's you, well, that may work, but I would really encourage you to be pausing, reflecting, and trying actual problems as much as possible. And for any teacher who might be watching this video, the same thing is true. I would just encourage you to be designing opportunities for your students to be doing those types of things and not just sort of posting a lecture video and, and being done with it. All right, so that was a little bit of a behind the scenes of my office, of my process of how I make videos as a math professor, as a YouTuber, as an edutuber, as they say. If you have any questions about this process, please leave them down in the comments below and I'm happy to contact you and to reach out. And if you enjoyed this video, well, please give it a like for that YouTube algorithm. I'm a mathematician and I really like algorithms and so apparently does YouTube. And with that, in the next video, we're going to be returning to some more math.